Please take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 21, if you would, please. Revelation chapter 21. We're just going to touch on the first eight verses of Scripture of this chapter as we begin to really settle a lot of the consternation, a lot of the misinformation that's going around in, in, in regards to future events. And we saw here as we look at the, the outline of Revelation chapter 1 and verse 19, uh, God has seen fit to give us that general outline. Uh, God always goes from the general to the specific. And so in chapter 1 and verse 19, we have the following words. It says, write the things which thou hast seen. It says, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. And of course, we see if you go to chapter 1, which we looked at months ago, we saw in verses 10 to 18 that John, on the Isle of Patmos, he had a vision and he saw a vision of oil. He was persecuted and uh, then they, they uh, exiled him to the Isle of Patmos and that's where he was able to pen uh, the words to this particular book of Revelation. And it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so the churches of John's day are mentioned in chapters 2 and 3. There's seven churches. Now the reason I'm going through this once again is because when we get here to chapter 21, I want you to see how all this gets connected. A lot of times we miss some of these connection points in the Word of God that helps add clarity uh, to our understanding. And so then we have the things which shall be, and that's the prophetic aspect. That's when John's pinning, he's saying, okay, this is the vision I saw. These are the seven churches of my day, and then this is what's coming after this. And though in chapter 4 and verse 1, you have what is referred to as the rapture. And so then from chapter 4, verse 2, down to the end of chapter 5, from this point on when it says, and the things which shall be hereafter, uh, you have from chapters 4 on to chapter 22. But in encompassing those uh, passages, those, those chapters from 4 to 22, you have a breakdown from there. And so you have the scene in heaven that's given for us in chapter 4 and verse 2 until chapter 22 and verse 16. And it says that these things that he's been teaching and writing about uh, need to be reiterated and passed along in the local church. And so there's that time, why, why is the church not mentioned from chapter 6 to chapter 19? Well, it's because the church is not there. It's not here on the face of the earth. We are in heaven. And so then you get to chapter 20 and you have the millennial reign as well as you have the great white throne judgment of Jesus Christ. And then in chapter 21 and 22, you have really a description of the new heaven and new earth and eternity has begun, so to speak, where there's no more time. And so our God has just laid this out for us. And so it's important for us to get that overall view as we dive into chapter uh, 21. And so I want to give an outline of this chapter, and then I want to read the first eight verses of Scripture uh, in regards to the blessings of an overcomer in chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. I want us to see, number one, the character of the Lord Jesus Christ is really emphasized, I believe, in these first eight verses of Scripture. Then you have from chapter, nine, excuse me, chapter 21, verse 9, on through, you'll have what we call the construction of the earth as well as the new uh, Jerusalem is described for us there. And then you have the contents that goes from uh, verse 22 of chapter 21 on through to chapter 22 and verse 5. And then we have the closing out, uh, what they would say is just sort of tying everything together here in the book of Revelation. So there's the outline, there's the character, the construction, and the way. And he who sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But the fearful, and unbelieving, and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, 
and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Dear Heavenly Father, as we read this passage of Scripture, I pray that you would just bring some things that may have caused some uh, concern in people's minds. Uh, may you give clarity through uh, the Word of God, through the preaching, the Holy Spirit as it applies and enlightens our minds. I pray that no one would be led astray uh, in these days. Uh, Lord, we believe that our time is short, and you could come at any time, and we want to be ready. And Lord, we want to be equipped to reach this world for Thee as You command us to go into all the world and preach Your gospel to every creature. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want us to see the character of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we see it really evidenced for us in this passage of Scripture. And remember, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we see here, first of all, that He is faithful. Uh, you know, I think sometimes we take faithfulness for granted. Uh, we may just make it a human trait, but it's so good to know that our God is faithful. The Lord Jesus Christ is faithful. And I find it interesting that as we travel through and we just come through this unsettling time of human history, here in the, from chapter 6 to chapter 19 of the book of, of, of Revelation, and then we hear and see about the uh, great white throne judgment, the judgment of those who have rejected Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. It's interesting that now that we're going into eternity as the blood-bought saints, that it's emphasized to us the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. In other words, everything that God has said from this time backwards all the way to the book of Genesis is faithful and true, and you can count on it. There's not failed one single promise in all the Word of God. Everything to this particular point that we're living in right now, according to the Scriptures that should be fulfilled, has been fulfilled. And so that gives us confidence in that which is yet to be fulfilled, because our God is faithful. Faithful, the definition for that is constant in performance of duties or services exact in attending to commands as a faithful servant. I'm going to ask you to go to John, if you would, the Gospel of John in chapter 17. John chapter 17. Now, I know when you look at Matthew chapter 7, a lot of times that's referred to as the Lord's Prayer, but that's really the disciples' prayer. You remember in the book of Luke, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And then Jesus said, well, when you pray, pray this way, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And he goes on from there. That is the, what we refer to as the disciples' prayer. But if you want to be more exact, you would say that John 17 is the Lord's prayer. And let's begin reading here in chapter 17, verse 1. And I want us to think about this as far as the faithfulness of the Lord Jesus Christ, as He is praying, talking to His Father. He says, These words spake Jesus, and lifted up His eyes to heaven, and said, Father, the hour is come, glorify Thy Son, and He always has been. And He declares that here once again uh, to us. And then He goes on to say uh, here in verse 6, I have manifested Thy name unto of the men which thou gavest me out of the world, thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. <laughs> that's, that's great. I mean, he's praying even now for uh, those disciples and those who have embraced him as uh, Savior. And you know, he continues on in the ministry of intercession today for us. He says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And that all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee Holy Father, 
keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. <laughs> There's such powerful truth here. I have to stop and just mention, you know, that we are one with Jesus Christ. The Bible says that when you get saved, you become one with him. You are seated with him in the heavenlies. Powerful truth. Ephesians chapter 1 says here in verse 12, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is, not, is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might uh, have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now he's talking about the son of perdition. That's, that's uh, Judas Iscariot, the one that would betray him. And he says, I have given them thy word, verse 14, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The Bible's true. And thou hast sent me into the world, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one even as we are one. I am them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. Wow, powerful truth. It would do us well sometimes just to sit and just read through that slowly, distinctly, and let the words of that truth sink deep in our hearts, how that we are one with the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise His name. But we see in this passage of Scripture that He is faithful from even before the foundation of the world. Our God is faithful. I also want us to see this, that His actions, as well as His words, you see the faithfulness and his name, his very name is faithful. Look back at our text passage of scripture here in Revelation chapter 19 in verse 11. We may bounce a little bit around uh, this morning uh, here in the message, but I want you to see this, how everything I'm trying to dovetail all this together. He says here in Revelation 19, 11, and I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true Notice in your King James Bible the capitalization there. In other words, he does not just have the characteristic of faithfulness, the characteristic of truthfulness. He is faithful. That's his name. He is true. Uh, what did Jesus say? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. He says, called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So then we see here that he's called the truth. We mentioned that. I just quoted John 14, 6. And then also we just read uh, chapter 19, verse 11 here in the book of Revelation. But you see how he's mentioned here in uh, verse, uh, verse 5. He says, And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. So we see here one of the characteristics as well as his very name 
is faithful, is true. And I also want us to see this, that he makes all things new. That's interesting. Uh, he doesn't just take something and refurbish it. Uh, he doesn't renovate it. If any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and when you get saved, he says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And you begin to see how these uh, truths that are mentioned in uh, the positional way are actually being fulfilled here at the end of time. And when I say the end of time, I'm not saying the end of existence. I'm saying the end of time as we know it, as we march into eternity where there is no beginning and no ending because God always has been, there is no time with him. There's only time with us. We're so geared to this world. We're so geared to the concept of time. What time is it? Uh, we're gonna be here for an hour or some hope. Uh, you know, that kind of thing. But we gear, we're geared to time. How much time is this going to take me? How much time do I have to be at work? How much time is it going to take me to get from A to B and so on? All time, time, time. And here at this particular place in Scripture, time will cease to exist. That's hard to, be, uh, to have that conception in our minds. But at the same time, it's going to be so. And he's going to make not all things renovated. He's going to make everything new. Look at verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Not this earth made over again. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And so he's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And bear in mind, if we think some of the sights around the world are as beautiful as they are, to our human eye to our sin-tainted uh, existence, just think what it's going to be when everything is brand new. I mean, you talk about beauty, as they're never, uh, we can never have that concept. <laughs> I mean, it's just a, a, a new heaven, a new earth. And then in verse 2, we see here, it's talking about the holy city. It's talking about a new Jerusalem. Notice what it says, And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now what's interesting about this new Jerusalem is there's not much said about it in the scripture. And yet it seems to be and indicate that it's not just being made now, that it's already been in existence. Now when you read some of the background of this that others have placed to it, uh, we don't really know uh, conjecture wise exactly uh, where this uh, city is suspended. Uh, we believe that it's up with God now and it comes down from God. Some people believe that it's a city uh, that's uh, uh, up there in the third heaven to be sure where God dwells now. But it's waiting for that time where everything will be made new and that new city of Jerusalem will come down and that old city of Jerusalem there in the Middle East is no more because it's been uh, destroyed by fire, the scripture says, purged by fire. And he makes a new heaven and a new earth. Amen. So it, it seems to indicate that this speaks of really also the saved, it says. It says, uh, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And we're called in this period of time, this dispensation, as the bride of Christ. And so it seems to indicate that this is a place, this city is prepared for us. This city existed really before time. Hard to wrap your head around in it. And then what I like too, if you'll look here in verse 6. And he said unto me, it is done. You remember what he said on the cross? It is finished. And what he was talking about, the plan of redemption for man is accomplished. It's finished. It's done. Now he comes to this particular point, and he's not talking about redemption solely. He's talking about all the prophecies, all the promises, everything that God has said would take place, it is done. When we look at the book of Revelation, and we see the vision that John saw, the seven churches and how they need to get some things in order. He says, you know, and the, 
the, you have the tribulation time, and you have the battle of Armageddon, you have the millennial reign, you have the judgment seat of Christ uh, there uh, back there in chapter 4, and then you have the great white throne judgment here in chapter 20 of the unsaved. You have people who have rejected Jesus Christ being consigned to the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone forever and forever and forever. And now we come and we are introduced to a new heaven, a new earth. The holy city, the new Jerusalem comes down from God out of heaven as a bride adorned for her husband. And he comes later on and he says, look, he says, my word is faithful because my name is faithful. Uh, I am the truth and my word is true. It is done. Everything that I have said has been accomplished. It is done. It's over. Amen. And that's really what it means. It is done. It's over. All the eternal promises of God have been fulfilled to this particular point and time ceases to be anymore. What a day that will be. And Jesus says, I'm the alpha. It takes on a new meaning here. We know that Alpha and Omega, he says, I'm the Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. In other words, everything starts with him and everything ends with him. It's done. And that's why he reiterates that to us. So this is the final of all finals. This is it. He declares to us and for us. He's the giver of life, as the scripture says. And I like that word freely, don't you? Amen. He paid the price. We sang that song in the congregational, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he made it white as snow. Amen? Freely. I want us to see now, now verse, uh, chapter 21, verse 7, on the blessing of being an overcomer. In verse 7 it says these words, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. In verse 8, we are introduced again to the concept, the truth of the second death. And he mentions this, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We need as those who are overcomers, never fear the second death. We see that the second death is reserved for these folks who have rejected Jesus Christ. And he reiterates for us, those that live those lifestyles, they, uh, they evidently are not saved. They've rejected Christ. And because of that, they will dwell for all eternity in that second death. So we need never fear the second death. Christian, you need never fear hell. He says it's done. In other words, he keeps his word. In 1 Peter chapter 1, it says that we are kept by the power of God. We're not kept by our own power, our own strength. We're not kept by the strength and power of a church, some other Christian. We're kept by God's power. We're weak. We can't, we can't keep ourselves, but we don't have to because we're kept by the power of God. And our God is all powerful. Amen? And we see where he mentions this in his word. So let me just say again, we need never fear the second death. Number two, we shall be with God forever. God the Father forever. Think about this. He walked this earth, Jesus Christ did, for about 33 and a half years. People interacted with him. They were with him. From the time that he breathed on them to receive the Holy Ghost, we find that at that particular time, the Holy Spirit came to indwell the life of the believer. The moment you got saved, you hear me say this a lot, but the moment you trusted Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit of God came into your life. So now you are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So you see Jesus Christ, for 33 and a half years he was with man. You see the Holy Spirit of God with the believer now. But then in this time you'll have God the Father and be in his presence 
forever and ever and ever. That's what he says here, for all eternity. You have God the Father. He says right here, he says, I will be his God and he shall be my son. There's that connection there. And now I want us to see how the overcomer is blessed. You and I are overcomers. Let's show it scripturally. Let's go to 1 John chapter 5. That's uh, just a couple of books up from the book of Revelation. 1 John chapter 5. Now, remember, John who penned the words of the book of Revelation, he also wrote the Gospel of John. He also did 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and the book of Revelation. And so he is, we're going to see how he ties things together here with the book of Revelation. It's, it's very fascinating to me because he uses the word overcomer many times in the book of Revelation. He uses it here in 1st John. And the only other time it's mentioned is here in 1st John and in the book of Revelation. And it's interesting that he's the penman that God used. And it's, it's exciting because every saved individual is an overcomer. Now, what happens is many times when people are taught that you can lose your salvation, they go to Revelation chapter 2 and they say, boy, you've got to overcome. You've got to hang in there. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Well, let's just let the Bible speak. And it says here in chapter 5, verse 1, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Look at verse 5. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. There's your salvation. So the moment you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, relying and trusting in him, you are an overcomer. You've already overcome. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in verse 57, it says, We have the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I say, we don't work for victory. We work from a position of victory. We are victorious. We're already victorious. And we're already overcomers. We're not done yet. To overcome means to subdue. It means to conquer. It means to prevail. It means to get the victory. Now notice the benefits. Hey folks, you're saved today. Notice the benefits found in the book of Revelation because you're an overcomer, because you're a child of God. Not just that you're going to dwell in heaven, even though that's part of it. But let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. This will put a little bounce in your step. Your heart may even do a little flip-flop there. Revelation chapter 2. Remember, this fits you. You are an overcomer. Chapter 2, verse 7. This is to the church at Ephesus. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, Holy Spirit, notice capital S, saith unto the churches, to him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Folks, when we get into the rest of chapter 21 and chapter 22, there's that tree of life. It's right there in the midst of that new heaven and new earth. It's right there, and that's part of our inheritance. Because we're an overcomer. We will have access to the tree of life. Man, I've got goosebumps running. Look at chapter 2, verse 11. And he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. We just talked about the second death in chapter 21, verse 8. Now, doesn't that make your heart do a flip-flop? Yeah. Wow. How exciting is that? Amen. Boy, you say, boy, I don't, I don't want to participate in that second death. I mean, death and hell were cast into the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. 
And here it says that all these people that are abominable and whoremongers and liars and all these kinds of things, uh, they will be what? They'll participate in the second death. In the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone. But if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you need not fear the second death. And remember in chapter 21, what does it say? It is done. It's done. It's done for us. We're just going to realize it later on, but it's already done. Why? Because he who is faithful, he who is true, has said so. And we can count on it. Praise God for that. We need not fear the second death. Uh, Talk about benefits. What a benefit. Look here in uh, chapter uh, 2, verse 26. The Bible says these words. Oh, I missed verse 17. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth save in he that receiveth it. And we're going to have his name easily identified. We're his. Amen? Because you're an overcomer. Already you're an overcomer. Look here what it says in verse 26 of this passage of Scripture. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. Where, when is he ruling with a rod of iron? He's ruling with a rod of iron in the millennial kingdom. That's for us. We'll be there too. Amen. Praise the Lord. He says, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my Father, Jesus says. My, this is rich. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. What's he going to do? Jesus is going to stand before God the Father and vouch for us. Father, he's mine. He's yours. He's going to do that for you. He's going to do that for me. All those who've accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, he's going to vouch for us. Look at chapter 3. Um, we did verse 5. Now let's look at verse 12. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. You begin to see some security here. You begin to see that you're an overcomer. And because you're an overcomer now, this is some of the benefits that you will receive when time ceases to be. Look at verse 21. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his own, or excuse me, in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. I trust we're in tune this morning. I trust you're seeing the truth of the word of God. You say, but I just keep having, you know, different voices echo in my ear as I've been growing up or as I've been exposed to different various doctrines. And I just wonder, can I really know? Yes, you can. Here it is. Now, folks, these verses of Scripture are not the normal verses that we use to give somebody the assurance of their salvation. But I trust you see that as you've trusted Jesus Christ, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, that you right now are an overcomer, and these are the benefits that you will receive as an overcomer. You need not fear the second death. 
Praise his name. In Psalm 68, verse 19, it says these words. Blessed be the Lord, who daily loadeth us with benefits. Even the God of our salvation, Selah. Sometimes we're just thinking about what we're going to have now. And what we do have now and the blessings we enjoy now. And that's great. That's good. We ought to do that. But what I want us to see is, man, if I can say it this way, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. (laughs) Psalm 103 verse 2 says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Then there's a question that the psalmist asks that we must ask ourselves today. Psalm 116 verse 12 says, What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? What did the psalmist say? What shall I render, in other words, give unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? 